We're grateful that you're here, though, for those of you who are here in person. I'm Rabbi Andy Merrow from the Jewish Center, and we have been, like you, heartbroken for the last several months, but also trying to do programming throughout the week and on Shabbatot to have people be able to learn, to open their hearts and minds. And we are grateful, grateful to have this opportunity to hear about trauma and the response to trauma and all of the incredible folks who are on the ground doing this work. In my work here at the Jewish Center, I am grateful for Moshe Margolin and Riva. Riva, are you coming up? Who are co-chairs of our Israel and Us Committee who continually meet to discuss what next? What next? What can we do next? Um, so they are working on what next? They're working on a Please God a Solidarity mission in the next few months and many other programs. Um, we want to invite you, though, as we begin tonight, to turn your ringers off so that our guest speaker has your full attention. And Riva will introduce our honored expert and guest, Riva Levy. Toda Rabbi, Erev Tov, everyone. So the news from Israel is once again devastating as it was announced that two more hostages were killed today and two soldiers were also killed. Unfortunately, since October 7th, we wake up every morning to heartbreaking news. The tragic events that occurred on October 7th have deeply affected many of us here. That is why Today's presentation is so important. When Yael Niv introduced us to Lisa, we were eager to invite her to speak. Lisa Flagel is an American Israeli writer based in Boston and a trauma specialist who has worked in conflict areas all over the world. Tonight, Lisa will tell the story of how she reacted to the news of October 7th. And as she writes in her own words, Remembering that I, I am a trauma therapist, I bought a plane ticket to go and help. In addition to describing her work with the evacuees from the kibbutzim and communities in the south of Israel, Lisa will equip the audience with fundamental tools for addressing trauma during her presentation tonight. We are also very lucky to have members from the Tzedek Center in Israel who will join Lisa and tell us about the important work they do. Please welcome Lisa. Yeah, just to warn all of you, I'm a big hugger. <laughs> so, you know, stay away if you can't handle it. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm imagining that there are many of you in this audience tonight who have heard the Moth Radio Hour. Show me your hands if you have. Or This American Life on public radio. Okay, so you all know about stories and what we can learn from them and how they help us feel our feelings in a safe way. This isn't a presentation. This isn't a lecture. Tonight, I'm telling you a story. I'm telling you a story of something that happened to me. I'm telling you a story that's deeply personal to me. And I'm telling you a story about how I personally have struggled since the morning of October 7th. And I'm deeply grateful. Can you stand up, the people from the Tzedek Centers? I'm so lucky to have these people to inspire me. Young people, they're the hope for the future. You're going to learn about them tonight. They're part of my presentation. And they're here from Israel. And you all are going to have an opportunity to talk to them. They're going to be doing small group conversations, which we'll explain more to you about. You each have a picture of a piece of luggage. The reason you have it is because everyone here has walked into this room with baggage. We all have baggage. Your baggage might be your feelings about Israel, 
It might be your feelings about being a Jew today with all the trauma and anti-Semitism and lack of surety. You might be worried about your kids. You might be thinking about what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning or what you didn't pick up at the grocery store. I'm going to ask you to take that piece of baggage and I'm going to fold it up. Fold it up. Let's see people folding, 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 folding. And I want you to put it under your tuchus or in your pocketbook or in your pocket. We're all going to put our own baggage aside for now. And we're going to buckle up for a story. Afterwards, at the end, when I finish this presentation, I'm probably going to need to cry for a few minutes. And uh, the rabbi and the Tzedek Center people will tell you about the next phase. I will be available in a separate room for people to come and talk to me, but I'm not doing a Q&A. Why am I not doing a Q&A? Because this isn't a lecture. This is a story. After a moth, you applaud. <laughs> if you want to applaud. If you don't want to applaud, you don't have to. Everybody ready? You folded your piece of paper, you put it on the side, your baggage is, your minds are clear. OK, thank you. So it's really important to talk about what trauma is. Because in today's world with the media, trauma this, trauma that, it's like the word doesn't even mean anything anymore. Trauma is a very specific thing. It impacts us a certain way. Oh, I'm supposed to be at the microphone. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So any, if anybody sees me walk away, just go like that. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, and, but trauma is something very specific. And when we call everything a trauma, it kind of takes away from the meaning of the word. And this, this I found was like a great way to really describe trauma is a response to experiences that deeply erode our sense of self. We no longer feel safe in the world or even in our own bodies. A traumatic experience is one that violates our trust, challenges our faith, and shakes our identity. We no longer of certain of our role or place in the world. And this is a map of what we call the Gaza envelope because it looks kind of like the lip of an envelope. And these are the kibbutzim that uh, Hamas attacked on that day. And uh, you can see close to the bottom, you see a little dot of kibbutz near Oz, which you've heard them a lot on the radio. And you'll hear more about them today. Now, OK, what, what is this? What? What? OK. Um, when I go to court in Boston, to juvenile court, um, with a juvenile defendant. The judge often says, and who is it that you have with you in court today? And the young person that I'm with looks around and feels very confident and glad because she says, well, Lisa's here with me from the Peace Institute. We have a whole team of people. And I had a son, John, who I took to juvenile court many times. And when the judge asked that question after he answered, he said, they see that I have people. They thought I didn't have people, but I had people. So that's one of the things I do in my life as a trauma specialist. And when the judge asks that question and the young person answers, I then say to myself, who do I have with me in this courtroom today? Who have I internalized that is supporting me so that I can do this work. Judith Rowe is one of those people. I know, it's hard. Judith Rowe was a member of the Jewish Center for many years, and we were very close. She was a very special person. I want you to hear about her. So Judith graduated high school early she graduated college early at the age of 20. She entered Yale Graduate School as the first woman to study in the sociology department. She was Hadassah chapter president. 
She quickly identified the changes computers could engender and was one of the earliest promoters of formalizing and demanding public access to government data. She was the founder of the Data and Statistical Services at Princeton University in 1964 and headed the service until her retirement in 1998. She was considered a foremost expert on the USA Census. She was a pioneer in the creation of the Census Bureau State Data Center Program, and she also had elected positions in the Association of Public Data Users and the Council of Professional Associations on Federal Statistics. She was one of the great pioneers of the social science data field, and her daughter, Becky, in Israel, is listening to us on Zoom now. So, Judith showed me an example of, of breaking the glass ceilings, of not being limited, of questioning the way things were. Most important of all, Judith taught me the importance of being curious and being courageous, because it takes great courage to be courageous. But she also gave me her daughter, Becky. This is Becky right here in the purple circle. Here we are on Young And we were in Young together. Here I am at Camp Tell Yehuda in my blue movement t-shirt. Zionist Youth Movement, I was very proud of it. I'm wearing a different one today. I'm not batting for the other team. This is my uniform in a lot. But it gave us a sense of community to be together. And when we moved to Israel, we had each other. We had shared values. And what's very important to know about trauma is one of the things that, that creates resilience is a deep belief system and understanding of principles and a sense of purpose in the world. And Judith gave us that daughter as my closest friend in the world. And this is the family. This is Becky and Noah and little Abby and Judith and Tal. And this is Lev. Lev when he was a little boy. And I'm their auntie. I'm their Dota. And Lev is one of the co-directors co-founders of the Tzedek Centers, of which you'll hear a lot tonight, and you're going to see a lot of Lev. We can go to the next slide. On October 7th, every one of us was changed. Ein Mishahu, Shalom Hikir Mishu. Every one of us was impacted. <laughs> So So terror, the terrorism, is a fear of the unpredictable, of annihilation and expulsion. This is our collective Jewish memory, transmitted as intergenerational trauma. As American Jews, the Tree of Life attack in Pittsburgh echoed that historical trauma. And now we are left to wonder once again, can we really be safe anywhere? We all question that. And so we have a sense of powerlessness, which is what characterizes trauma. And we say, are the Jewish people being abandoned again? Israel was always there. Can Israel still be there for us? The IDF is invincible. They always say the day. Where were they that day? Now nowhere feels safe to us. Israel is central to my Jewish identity. But my collective ethnic memory perceiving threat and acts of violence as being around every corner 
As Jews, we assume bad things will happen, and all of those things together bring us to a sense of powerlessness. On October 7th, I woke up in the morning to a text from a friend, Lisa, what happened to your country? I was at a friend's house in New Hampshire, and I walked up and down the stairs. What do I do? How can I help? I was emotionally devastated. We all were. I felt powerless. I scoured the news. I, I was on WhatsApp checking messages. I was calling my friends in Israel. And most importantly, I felt insurmountable grief. And then I remembered, I'm a trauma therapist. There's something I can do. I'm not powerless. And I bought a plane ticket, October 7th, three hours after I got the news. And then, Becky called. And Becky put me on the phone with Lev, who grew up, and Moran, his wife, Lev, who co-runs the Tzedek Centers, and Moran, who was in charge of the entire deployment of their operation called Mechabkim et Hadarom, embracing the Gaza envelope communities. So while I was busy fretting and pacing back and forth, Becky Sun Lev and the Tzedek Centers and Ashomar Tzair already had deployed to 10, was it 10 or more than 10? 15? 15 evacuee sites throughout Israel by October 10th. October 7th, they, the, the survivors hit these evacuee centers. On October 9th, they deployed by October 10th. And they said to me, Lisha, we need you to come. And I said, all right, I'm coming. Now, the ticket I had bought was for two weeks. I said, how long do you need me to come for? And she said, well, you know, it's really better for a month, but at least two weeks. I said, all right, I'll come for 10 days. This is how I pictured them. A Shomer Hatzair who led the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In my mind, these are the heroic people who you can depend on, who you can trust to do what's right, the hardest thing. Nothing scares them. These are my people, and I was going to be with them. <laughs> and here they are, the team. And I said, what am I? What's wrong with me? I'm going to go for 10 days. I'm going to go, and I'm going to barely figure out what's going on. And I changed my plane ticket to a month. And I said, I'm on my way. I got to Israel. Once I bought my plane tickets, th things seemed to move at breakneck speed. People were calling, bringing me donations. I enlisted a Cracker Jack team to get me packed and out the door, just like such a team brought me here tonight. When I landed in Israel, I really landed. I wasn't afraid of the missiles. I wasn't afraid of the uncaught terrorists still wandering the streets, but I hesitated. Was it arrogant to think that I might be able to help these people somehow? Then Miriam said, Lisa, it's the same thing you've always done, but more. On my first day in Israel, I went to a vigil. Of the hostages, and I came from Boston yesterday to provide trauma support. And you can see how people, I'm going to cry. How and I want you to look at this picture right here. And you'll go to the next slide. It, this was serious. This was a meme that was going around. It's kind of a car cartoon. And it's a, a satire on headlines. And it says, the shittiest possible situation there could ever be. Everything really sucks. There's nothing we can say. We've fallen on our, play, our face. Everything is devastating. Everything here is terrible. Everything, everything is garbage. And it was hard not to feel that way. But remember, I'm a trauma therapist. And the other thing is, this is Yael. Yael and I had never met, but we're both part 
of Mothers Against Violence in Israel. And the Mothers Against Violence started the Yellow Ribbon Campaign. And Yael called me before I left and she said, I'm going to send you to Israel with yellow ribbons because they've run out. Right after that hostage vigil that I was at, I met up with Ketty and she gave me my fluorescent vest and I felt empowered. I felt like part of a community. And we ran around Tel Aviv, tying yellow ribbons around people's wrists, tying them around poles. And it reminded me that art, it was a work of art. It was performance art. Art exists that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things. This was a work of reparation through our creativity and the way we use the yellow ribbons. Next. All right, then I got to a lot. This is the Abraham Hostel, and this is where I was placed the, my first week. This is me with a bunch of Ethiopian kids. Is Ethiopians in a lot? Everybody, oh. no one could believe it. But there they are. Yeah, there's Ethiopians in a lot. Really? Really? Where are they from? They're from Tzfat. So there's Ethiopians in Tzfat? There's Ethiopians in Tzfat. What are they doing in a lot? So they were moved to a lot because there were missiles in Tzfat as well. And their absorption centers where they'd lived, they had only been in Israel for a year and a half, did not have proper bomb shelters, did not have proper protection. So they brought them to a lot. This part of a lot is kind of far, I mean, in a lot perspective, from where all the hotels were, that the evacuees were. No one believed there were Ethiopians in a lot. That little dialogue you just heard between my brother-in-law and I, I had a thousand times. And I said, I'm living in a hotel, in a youth hostel with 600 of them. Now, it seemed very far away from everything else. Maoz Inon, who's one of the founders of the Abraham Hostels, it's a social enterprise. These hostels and tours promote dialogue, tolerance, and unity, while also advocating for equality and democracy. But it wasn't far away from everything else, because his parents were murdered at Atif HaAsara on October 7th. The entire city of Eilat was a therapeutic milieu. No one was untouched. So then they, the, the Ethiopians went to Jerusalem and back to Tzvat, and I went to the Austral Palma Hotel. Look, I'm an old lady, like a youth hostel, really. I mean, I was a good sport about it, because you know, I don't want people to think I'm old. Um, and uh, every morning, I would uh, come out of the lobby, and I would wait for my ride. Um, and people would come up to me, and they'd say, oh, who are you? Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. And this happened on this particular day. And this gentleman came up to me, and I told him, we didn't call the hotels by the names of the hotels. We called the hotel by the name of the community that had evacuated to it. So the, near Oz was in Malon Yamsuf. But we said, I'm going to Nir Oz. My first day there, someone said, I'm going to Nirim. I said, how are you going to Nirim? It's a, it's, a, it's a closed military area. And they were like, no, the hotel, you idiot. Anyway, so, so I say, I'm going to Nir Oz. And he says, oh, it's so terrible what those people went through. And I said, yes, it is. And he said, tell me, are they leftists? And I looked at him, and I knew why he was asking me the question. And I had to split into two people. The me in front is the me, the trauma therapist. The me in back is me, the human being. He was asking me that question because if I said yes, he was going to say, then they deserved what happened to them because they brought this on themselves. Now, if I wasn't a tenured trauma therapist, I might have yelled at him. I might have argued with him. But instead, I understood him. The people in the Austral Palma Hotel were from Ashdod and Ashkelon. And they didn't get the same benefits as people from the Gaza envelope. 
If you lived up to seven kilometers from the border, you got full room and board, and you were evacuated by the army, by the government. But if you were over that, you maybe got half room and board. You had to self-evacuate, and people were very bitter about that. And this man, by making this very angry statement, was trying to have some power in the world. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was trying to say that he was important, and he mattered, and that he mattered too. And I said to him, because I've been doing this for many years, I said, you know, all I know is that these are people who are suffering. These are people in a great deal of pain. And my job is to be with them in that pain. And I don't really ask them about their political opinions. But thanks for asking. And this is what I knew. This is a video that came out before I went to Israel. This is a young woman from Kibbutz Be'eri who was evacuated to the Dead Sea. And this is what she said about her experience. וראיתי את הפנים של אנשים מהשכונה שלי, פחד, פחד אלוהים. וראיתי פנים שהכרתי מאז שאני זוכרת את עצמי, כמו שאף פעם לא ראיתי אותם, דמעות. אנשים שגדלתי איתם, פחד. וזה להסתובב פה, רק הגעתי לים המלח. זה להסתובב פה במקום הזה ולראות את הפנים של חברי הקיבוץ שלי מנסים. להצליח לקום בבוקר, להחזיק מעמד, לחייך מדי פעם. So, I had that in my heart as I was about to enter the lobby of Nir Oz. I was thinking that this is what I was about to face, people who had been through this. So this is how I would walk. There's like a little driveway here, and I would walk toward the lobby. And on this particular day, I got a phone call from my friend Brian, who's the principal of a Jewish day school in the Boston area. And his students wanted to interview me about my experience. They were 13 and 14 years old. They asked me really great questions. Now, I want to tell you right now, Outside, there's like a bibliography, and my podcast, and my NPR interviews and stuff. I'm not telling you all of the stories because we'd be here for a week. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about this one question. Eli asked, 14 years old. He said to me, well, I don't think I should ask my question. I don't think it's right. And Brian said, well, Eli, I think it's a good question I'm going to ask this question. And Brian said, Eli wants to know, you're working there, you're with those people, but what about the people in Gaza? And I said, Eli, that's a really interesting question. I wonder why you didn't want to ask me that question. Remember, he's 14 years old. And he said, I don't think it's fair to you. You are deeply immersed in the story of these people, these survivors. It's not fair of me to pull you out of that and try and place you somewhere else. I was shocked at the insight and the sensitivity. And I thought about what he said, and I said, you know, that's, that's amazing how thoughtful you are. And I said to him, to ask me that question you're not pulling me out of here. I'm a trauma therapist. I believe that violence happens when people feel victimized. When their trauma isn't treated and they feel victimized, they feel entitled to do terrible things. And if we want there to be peace, we need to treat the trauma. And I go wherever the trauma is. 
I go to whoever needs the help. I've been to Gaza. I've been all over Palestine. Right now I'm here to restore humanity. And it doesn't matter who the human beings are. And they said, that's cool. OK, so you kind of have to imagine. You walk into this hotel. This is the Yamsuf Hotel. And on the right-hand side, there's this long sofa. There's a little sign that says Emdat Hosen, a resilience center. And if you were a survivor of the massacre of that horrible day, and you felt like you needed to talk to someone, you could simply sit on this couch. And a therapist would appear to talk to you. The lobby was beautiful. It was bright. It was airy. And this was my therapeutic milieu. Now, I said to myself, because I, I was scared. I was like, who do I think I am? And I said, who do I have with me? Who am I bringing with me into this room today? And I thought of two people. One of them is my friend Donald Osgood, who runs the neighborhood trauma teams in the city of Boston. And we go out immediately following a stabbing, a shooting, or a homicide in real time. And I thought about how he calls me sis, and how he accepts me, and how he trusts me. And I felt his trust in me. And I also thought about the Israeli Trauma Coalition, which I've worked with many years. Israel Trauma Coalition is the cornerstone in the treatment of national trauma. They manage resilience centers, regional training centers, and they provide psychosocial support to individuals and communities and strengthen the resilience of Israeli intervention team. But the most important thing about the Israel Trauma so Coalition, they brought the word resilience into the Israeli lexicon. It wasn't a word that people used 20 years ago. It wasn't a word people used 15 years ago. But now it's part of the lexicon. It's the immediate response to trauma is how do we foster resilience. And I thank my friend Tali Levanon, the head of the Israeli Trauma Coalition, who I responded with her to the Boston Marathon bombing, because they came here to support Boston. So you saw on the slide it said safety and stabilization, according to Judy Herman, whose book is out there, Trauma and Recovery, second book, Trauma and Repair. The first stage of response to acute trauma is safety and stabilization. We want to make sure that people are in a safe place and that they are stabilized. And then the next phase, we need to allow people room for remembrance and mourning. This is a wedding hall, an event hall in the hotel. And it was transformed into the communal shiva room. Because they couldn't bury their loved ones on their kibbutzim, because their kibbutzim were closed military zones. And they couldn't sit shiva in their own homes, because their homes had been burnt down. So they had this room, and on the outside of the room, it said, Cheder nichumim lemishpachot hanirtzachim, the grieving comfort room for families of the murdered. And every day, there was a different list of who was sitting Shiva and what time you could come see them. The whole hotel was full of noise and children and laughter and singing. And this was off to the side and very quiet. Now, the next phase we have to go to is relationships and interconnectedness. Because remember, trauma is a violation of trust. And we have to restore trust. We have to restore the belief and the viability of relationship and, 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 and find a way to restore connection. So you see here the, the Iskor candles and the names of the dead. It's no coincidence that right behind this, you, can, you have to look behind. You'll see a man on a laptop. There's a table there. And the entire executive of Kibbutz Nir Oz sat there every day on their laptops, figuring out how to restore the framework, the economic structure, the social structure of the kibbutz. And all day long, you would walk by, and they would be there. They'd be at it, figuring out how to do it. 
Now, it was, we would often say to ourselves, like, this is like delusional, like, where are we? And, 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 and what are we doing here? And, and how do we think, you know, we can be of any help? There was an electronic bulletin board. An electronic bulletin board might say, if you need to see an orthodontist on Wednesdays from two to three, they're behind the spa. If you need to see a pediatrician, they're under the diving club from five to six on Wednesdays. Regular announcements like that, the laundry, but there were also announcements like this. The police are coming to take testimony from survivors of October 7th. We are creating, we are collecting all the remembrances. If you want to give us copies of the eulogies that you read at the funerals or your remembrances of people, Nir Oz is grieving. There's a WhatsApp group for announcements. Make sure you check your WhatsApp groups. The most ironic, this is the hostess station on the way into the dining room. And one day on my way to dinner, there was this handwritten sign. Now, I want to tell you that on my first day in a lot, someone like dragged me to an orientation. And the woman running the orientation is the world expert on humor in the Holocaust. And she said, you know, in our orientation, I want you to all know it's OK to be funny. Even in the Holocaust, there was humor. So I was like, phew, because, you know, I'm kind of funny. So um, <laughs> that's what I got, you know. So anyway, this is sad, right? But I get to the entrance, and I read the sign, and it says, if you're going to Yossi's funeral tomorrow, you need to be in the parking lot at 1230 sharp, and we're not waiting for anyone. No dawdlers. And I was like, so now I'm supposed to go eat dinner, right? OK. The most incredible support people in the hotel were the sons and daughters of the kibbutz that had left the kibbutz. They'd grown up, they left, they got married, they went away. But on October 10th, along with the Merkazim Lutzedek Chavreti and Shomer Atzair, the sons and daughters of kibbutz near Oz came. And because they had been part of that community, people trusted them. They allowed them in. They allowed them to help. But because they weren't there on October 7th, they also knew that they were available to care for them. And it was amazing. I mean, I had a perch in the lobby. You know, they're like, Lisa, are you going to be at your perch today? And these folks hung out. It was amazing and inspiring to see the things they did. Now, this is the team, not in their partisan Warsaw ghetto outfits, but in their blue shirts. And um, Okay, for all you Hashomer Tzayir lovers in the audience. Um, and, you know, we had shared assumptions, which is part of what made, you know, these people were strangers. I hadn't met them before, but I am the unofficial or official auntie of all of Hashomer Tzayir. So it was okay. And because of our common goals and beliefs, I came in with confidence in them and in our shared mis mission. But we still had to learn a lot about each other. We still now, when we really get into trouble with trauma is when we lose our curiosity about ourselves and others, when we lose our capacity for self-reflection. This is the toxic effect of trauma on curiosity. Curiosity is the opposite of trauma. If I can be curious, I have to feel safe. Trauma is conditioned limitation caused by a sense of threat. Curiosity opens the door to possibilities. We become preoccupied with keeping ourselves safe rather than trusting others to help us. Traumatized people can shock and paralyze us 
with their extreme hopelessness and aggression. One gentleman looked at me one day, saw me every day. One day he decided to sit next to me and tell me his story. And he told me what happened in the safe room. And, and he said, I planted every blade of grass on near Oz on my hands and knees, and it's all burnt. It's all destroyed. How can I be a father? How can I believe in a future? As helpers, we can't collude or be drawn into that trap. People trying to paralyze us, they do this because the only way they can know that we know how they feel is to make us feel stuck. But we can reflect back. October 7th was a day like no other. There is no way anyone could comprehend the magnitude of what happened. But I'm curious, what happened when you got to Eilat? When you arrived at the hotel? Oh, when we arrived at the hotel, there were hundreds of people waiting for us. And they had tears streaming down their faces. And, and they had everything we could need. We were barefoot. We didn't have anything. Our houses had been burnt. We couldn't go. Some of us had five minutes to get our stuff. But most of us had nothing. And they had everything you could need. They had food, and they had clothing, and they had sheets, and pillowcases, and cosmetics, and kitchen supplies, anything we could need. And they hugged us. And they cried. And I looked at their tears, and I knew they felt guilty because they had not protected us. But when I saw them and felt their arms around me and saw the abundance they brought, I said, maybe there is hope after all. And maybe there is something we have in order to rebuild. Even with the most unthinkable pain and horror, the trauma therapist can find a way by asking the right question to listening for the right word, to making meaning of the other person's paralyzed grief, to instill hope. There are different kinds of hope. There's realistic hope. There's utopian hope. There's hope we choose to have. There's hope that transcends the situation. Rebecca Solnick says, to hope is to give yourself to the future, and that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. Now, curiosity, community, and compassion made it possible to begin healing. Even though the team was, we all had vicarious traumatization. We all had secondary traumatic stress. We got into arguments. We got into fights. We are like, who the hell are you? Who do you think you are? But our curiosity and sense of community and compassion kept us together. And having our staff meetings here on the beach in a lot with a full moon didn't hurt. The water of a lot was healing for everyone, for our team, for the people who got up in the morning and would go scuba diving or snorkeling, the waves, the water, the wind, the moon. Well, water is the first line of defense against trauma. I know, it sounds crazy, you know? It's like so terrible. So much has happened and it's tragic and, and what can you do? And it's also hopeless, but actually water, and this was the, the, the um, bar in the hotel always had these two big, ice-cold, dripping wet cisterns of water. And you could go and you could drink. And much of the way I formed relationships with people, I would look around the lobby, and if someone was crying or looked distressed or lonely, I would simply hand them a cup of water. And they would look at me and say, how did you know? How did you know that's what, is what I needed? And the next time they would see me, they might sit next to me, and they might tell me their story. Water is the first line of defense against trauma 
because when we traumatize our brains, flood with the chemical cortisol, which dehydrates us, we need the water to function. Now, another thing that was comforting was replicating kibbutz life right there in the hotels. And those of you who have been to Israel and been to a kibbutz know that there's machsam v'gadim. The machsam v'gadim is an important part of the kibbutz life. So where were they going to have a michpasa? Where were they going to have a machsam v'gadim? This is next to the pool and the hotel. They had the washing machines. And it's also, when you think about trauma, it's like this big psychological, oh, you know, you've got to be some Freud genius or whatever. But actually, the logistical problems and challenges are the most important ones to solve because that's part of the safety and stabilization. And so there was nothing more comforting than hanging out with people doing their laundry in the Mahsan Bagadim. It just happened to be right next to the hotel swimming pool. OK. Now, you need to know, I'm not like, you know, a very normal person. Um, I don't have a normal fear instinct. And when I was told people I was going to Israel, they say, we don't want you to go. You're going to get killed. There are missiles. There are terrorists. And they said, ah, we're not even going to bother trying, because you're going to go anyway. But please be careful and don't get killed. And I said, don't worry. There are never missiles in a lot. First Gulf War, second. Gulf War, not a single Scud missile anywhere in the Eilat Arava area. And lo and behold, one day in the evening, we were heading back for evening programming, and Today, the resort town of Eilat on the Red Sea was targeted by a drone. The IDF confirmed they shot it down. Okay. This morning in Eilat, in the southern sector, IDF forces identified an aerial target that was approaching Israeli territory. Alerts were sounded, there is no threat, and there is no danger. Yemen's Houthi rebels confirmed they were behind the drone attack. Yemen! Not only was there a missile, but from Yemen! Israel never been attacked from Yemen. So here it was, nighttime, and we hear the alert. And we're in the car. And so Shahar, who I'm driving with, he says, all right, we got to get out of here. And he drives the car like a high-speed car chase in a movie. And we go into the closest hotel. And we drive into the parking lot. And we jump out of the car. And we leave the doors open. And we run up the steps. And there's a lady in a fluorescent vest. And she goes, the bomb shelter's over there. And we run to the bomb shelter. And it's crowded. And there's no room to go. And Shahar said, would it be OK if we came in? And they said, oh, certainly. And they tried to get out of our way. And we went in and we squeezed our way to the bottom of the stairs and lo and behold I was sitting underneath the dress of a bride whose wedding had been interrupted and behind her was her groom now I told you everywhere I am I'm a therapist and I said to myself what can I do for this couple to restore their hope, to give them back their happiness. So I started singing. And everybody in the bomb shelter joined me and sang. And Simon Tov, Mazel Tov, and the bride and groom smiled. And the alert was over, and we ran up the stairs, and we got into our cars, and we went back to work. And I said, there's always a way to instill hope. So I talked about my first conversation with Yael, who said, I'm going to send you yellow ribbons. But even Amazon had run out of yellow ribbons. It wasn't just Israel. The whole universe had run out of yellow ribbons. And so the people, the, the, the grandmothers, of the hostages said, we're going to knit yellow ribbons. And they sat in the lobby, and they began to knit. And slowly, the whole kibbutz came up to them. And everybody, they, you know, they did that thing where you hold the yarn. And they, and they were making the yellow ribbons, and they were tying them on each other's wrists. And I saw 
them transform from grieving hopeless people through this act of, of knitting yellow ribbons, how they came together and were emboldened. This is Bubble Girl. There's lots of stories about Bubble Girl. You have to get the bibliography because I'm not going to tell them here. They're great stories. I would love to tell them because I love to talk about Bubble Girl. But I have to tell you, just like tonight, where we don't have a lot of time, you know, I always felt like every conversation, every intervention, there wasn't enough time. When, when, I, when I finished talking to someone afterwards, I would say, I wish I said this, I wish I said that, or, or, or you know, what was the theme? What was the most important thing? And, and how, do I, how do I continue the conversation? So I created, I invented a therapeutic modality, which I called DJ Trauma. And after each one of these conversations, I would find a song that I thought represented our conversation, or the theme, or the mood, or the thing I hadn't said, or a little bit more of comfort, a little bit more of encouragement. And the best song I found was this one. I feel so sad, uh-huh. I feel so bad, uh-huh. I feel so mad. Uh-huh, breathe in, breathe out, my mind is here, uh-huh, my mind is there, uh-huh, life is unfair, uh-huh, breathe in, breathe out, I feel so blue, uh-huh. So I was in the dining room, and I'm like, this is Holly Near. And um, I'm like, wait, did she like take the diagnostic symptom manual and like <laughs> translate it into a song? Because she describes every trauma reaction and that the answer is to breathe in and breathe out and control our breathing. Because in trauma, we lose control, but we can control our breathing. So I'm sitting in the, in the dining room with Bubble Girl. She's four and a half years old. She's a smart aleck. They were in the reinforced room for eight hours. The Hamas was shooting smoke bombs and they were choking to death and they couldn't see each other because there was so much smoke in the room. And finally, some way, somehow, her dad managed to find the window and break it and they were able to escape through the window and make, made it to safety. But her uncle, her mother's brother, was killed on Kibbutz Kisufim and her father's twin brother, was hostage, and his wife and his kids. Her cousin, when you remember the first video you saw of me with those pictures, those were her cousins. And so she was acting out all over the place, and people were like, oh my god, what are we going to do with this kid? And I was like, all right, I got this. But you got to read the story on the blog. Anyway, I'm sitting with her in the dining room, and I say, you know, I got this great song, and I played it for her. She doesn't speak any English at all. I explained it to her. And we're sitting there and having a good old time, and then a whole group of people walk in, and they're loud, and they're noisy, and they're hitting the chairs as they're walking by us. She gets really irritated, and she goes, oh, get out of here. I hate you. I don't want to see you. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, I'm like a badass trauma therapist, so I'm going to reflect back to her. And I said, oh, you know, when I'm sitting quietly and eating my breakfast, with my friends and family. I don't want people to come in and be noisy, and I don't want them to distract me, and it makes me really angry. Four and a half, doesn't speak English, turns around to me and says, well, I don't know why you just don't do what the song says. Breathe in, breathe out. What's wrong with you? So you never know where hope is going to come, where change is going to come from. This was one of the most difficult, dramatic, and uplifting days. It's the only time I cried. This is the 30 days recognition from when the attack happened, November 7th. And Kululum, which is this really awesome people, they come and they teach songs to hundreds, thousands of people. And they came together with Avraham Tal, a very well-known Israeli singer, and they taught a song. 
And at the beginning, people were uncertain, they were unsure, they opened their mouths up a little bit, they looked around, was it okay to sing? And we walked around the team and we were like, oh my God, like what, what are we doing? And we had trays of water. And as they went on, their voices got louder and they stood more upright and they learned the harmony. And the song was reverberating throughout the hotel. I had never seen such a transformation in my life. And I felt like I had been privy to a holy sanctuary. At the end of the singing, Avraham Tal asked them all to hold up those pictures of their loved ones who were hostages. And it was on Israeli TV that night all over the country. My friends were watching the news. And I was the news. They were the news. Singing empowered. Singing required them to regulate their breathing. And it brought them together as a community. It was the emo most amazing thing I ever saw in my life. <sighs> Thank you for understanding. Okay, so it was getting time for me to leave. I was like, how can I leave this place? I can't go, I can't go. These people have become a part of me. And the whole time I'm there, I don't have to say, what can I do? Because I'm doing something. When I leave, I'm gonna have to just deal with the pain. But you know, and so God made sure there were two missile attacks my last day in Eilat. Now, I told you I don't get scared, I don't cry, but this day, I was so worried about Bubble Girl, and we got all the kids, and this was the bomb shelter for the children, like a Chuck E. Cheese kind of place, a playroom, yellow dudas, they called it, and, and we got the kids in, and the room was full, but I didn't see Bubble Girl, and I started crying because I was worried about her, and no, she can't die the day before I leave, I love her, and... The next thing I know, she's popping her head out from under the chair and she goes, what are you doing here? Go away. And I went, all right. And then I went, eh. And she went, eh. And everybody was okay. This is the Israeli writer David Grossman. And this is what he says about loss and grief. The first feeling you have is one of exile. You are being exiled from everything you know. You can take nothing for granted. You don't recognize yourself. I felt like someone who had experienced an earthquake, whose house had been crushed, and who goes out and takes one brick and puts it on top of another brick. I felt I was building my home again with every day of my work in that hotel. It was a way of fighting against the gravity of grief. This used to be so hard for me to express, but now, when I talk about it, I feel able to say that it was a way of choosing life. So, how do you say goodbye to people? When I came to Israel, the hostages were an idea. They were something I saw on TV. When I got to Tel Aviv, there were pictures of hostages and they became more real. But when I left Israel, I knew these people. This is Bobo Girl's uncle. I had learned to love these people. This is the corridor on the way to the gate at Ben Gurion Airport. And I said, how can I leave these people? I know them. I love them. I care about them.
And people said to me, how does it feel to be going home? And I was like, oh, I'm glad you know where my home is. Because I'm always divided. I'm always in Israel and here. I never know where my home is. But I know where I need to be in a situation like that. When they announced that hostages would be released, everybody was so anxious. We didn't know if they would bring dead bodies, if they'd bring people alive. We didn't know if Hamas was going to come and just start shooting and killing. And we so much wanted to see them. And so my friends from Ashomer and the America's Museum sent me a picture. This was the Shiva room. And now it was a room of hope because they were watching on the flat screen TV the hostages being exchanged. And you can see they're scanning their necks, craning to see, are these my family members? And I was so grateful to them for sharing this picture with me. And who was released? Bubble Girl's cousins and her aunt. And it wasn't enough. And it didn't solve the problem. And it didn't end the war. But it was something. It was people that I knew and people that I loved coming home. So how do I deal with my trauma? Well, you already know, I kind of crack stupid jokes. Um, I'm an artist, and I paint. And this is a painting of Kibbutz Ketura, where I lived for many years of my life. I became an adult there. and. It's a beautiful mountain range. And it could be snowing, it could be a blizzard, I could be in the Appalachia, and I would still paint the Arava Mountains, because that is what is in my heart, and that is what nurtures me. And it was so smart of Moran to say, we want you to go to a lot, because I would be with my mountains, and no matter what I dealt with in that hotel, I had those mountains that I love supporting me. And it came time for Nir Oz to transition to a more permanent status, to leave the hotel. This is their last day. This is the mural that they painted. And you can see the hope, the anticipation, the anxiety. The person you saw talking, that was the chef. It was an important part of the trauma team. And they went to Carme Gat near Kiryat Gut, and hundreds of people helped them get ready. And when they got to Karme Gut, there was a big billboard welcoming them, Hevrei near Oz, Bruchim Abayim. And people lined the streets with Israeli flags welcoming them. This is their transitional home for two years, three years, while their kibbutz is rebuilt. They had a big party on their last day to thank all the volunteers. It broke my heart not to be there, but again, my friends from Ashur Matzair and the Merkazim sent me a picture so I could be part of it. And at the end of the party, at the end of the presentation, they had a big slide that said, Toda, thank you. Lekol hashutafim b'ktivat hasipur shalanu to the people who came and helped us with a new narrative. And I thought, they're thanking me. I was there. I got to be a part of that. And then I thought, what are you thanking me for? I'm the one who's grateful to you for allowing me in. So it, it, They're going to tell you what's happening. Yes, it says thank you and hydrate. So you will have a moment in the lobby to get a little bit of water if you'd like. Um, these folks here are Israelis who are just here for less than a week.
And they're here to tell the story of what the TEDx centers are doing in terms of um, relief and support all over Israel. And so they are going to do three breakout rooms right now. Four? Uh, okay, so they'll be small. One of them is for Dovrei Vrit, right? And so, you don't have to be Israeli, but you need to speak Hebrew for that room. They're not going to translate. It's for people who really want to use their Sfat M to be able to be comfortable in, in their in Hebrew, in their mother tongue. And that is going to, who's going to that one? Okay, so that room, that those folks are going to the room that says Hamo Adon. Hamo Adon, our, our youth lounge. And now we'd love for you to come up and tell them your names and where you're from and what each of your rooms are going to be. And then we'll have someone here direct folks. And we'll, we'll just spend maybe 20 minutes uh, or so, and then we'll come back here at the end. If you want, and if, if you're done, we understand that as well. So, we're going to start in five minutes, but let's tell them, come up to the, and also for those of you, there's 120 people in the live stream. There will be a room in here for people in the live stream, someone from the SEDEC centers, but is going to stay in here to talk to the folks on the live stream. But can you guys come up and explain the break happens? You have to do it on the... So, hi, my name is Haga. I'm going to be talking about our educational activities uh, with the evacuated communities and also in the cities in the, in the south. And I'm going to be talking uh, with you guys uh, in the library. Um, easy is in the Moadon in Hebrew, about talking about uh, something that is a little bit different, the municipal elections uh, that we have in Israel. It was supposed to be uh, at October. It's going to be at the end of February, and Easy's going to talk about that in Hebrew. Maya is staying right here to talk more about our emergency relief. Um, a lot of topics, specifically also in the south. Uh, and um, Bar is going to be in the room over there. I'm not sure it's the Beit Midrash. The, the Beit Midrash, uh, talking about our work uh, in mixed cities in Israel. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see you in five minutes.
Should I just start? Yeah, but you have to. Okay. Okay. Hi. So, first of all, I want to say that I'm really, really excited to be here. And. You have the largest group of all. There are oh, wow. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, thank you. That is really amazing, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'll start, and I'll say <laughs> that my name is Maya, um, and I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, I will tell you my story. I'll tell you my story, and at the end, I will give uh, a few minutes for questions, if they will be. Um, but I'm really happy that you are here with us online and being part of this evening. So, like I said, I am Maya. I'm from the Tzedek Centers, and I was part of the group that was in charge of the emergency response. And I would like to say a few things about the Tzedek Centers at the beef, to start this evening and to tell you what, what is the Tzedek Centers, what do they do. So the Tzedek Centers, is a national organization of people that is a grassroots organization. Hi, are you joining us? <laughs> um, is a grassroots organization that is spread all around Israel. And our model is that we work with the people in each and every one of the cities. We have centers that are physical centers that people could come, mostly 18 and up. People could come, and we have their action groups. And what we do is that we try to promote leadership and organization of communities together in every municipality that we are working. And we have different centers all around Israel. We have centers that are in mixed cities. We have centers in Russian-speaking cities. And now we're opening centers in the south. And what we do is really building the community with the community itself, like the tools I said before. Um, so that is like an overview on the Tzedek Center, so you know in general. And I'd like to say a few, a few things about my personal story. So I came to work in the Tzedek Centers during the time of the local elections. Um, and before that, I used to live in the city of Netivot, which, in the, which is in the western Negev of Israel. And I worked in the municipality there for five years in different positions. And I studied in the College of Sapir, which is in Sderot, for three years. So I'm a graduate. Um, so this is all the, that area, the Western Negev area, is an area which I is kindly, uh, which is in deeply in my heart and I feel super, super connected to. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, so this is, this is like an overview. Uh, I don't know if all of you guys know here from home that the Western Negev, like Lisa showed in the beginning in her map, has kibbutzim and has cities like Netivot and Sderot and Ashkelon and Ofakim. And some of them are more than the seven kilometers, like she talked about, but I will say more about that. Um, and some of them are like big cities, like I said, Ashkelon, Ofakim, Sderot, Netivot, and every city has like hundreds of people that living in different communities in every city. And there are kibbutzim uh, in uh, Moshavim in that area. So this is, I'm just trying to frame the area that I'm talking about. So what happened is that I came to the Tzedek Centers during the local elections. And what happened is that during the local elections, we did all kinds of activities uh, with people all around Israel and activists about the importance of voting. And then um, what happened is we were really into that and organizing that and doing that with the communities all around Israel. And then October 7 happened. And for me, it was really, really hard uh, because, like I said, I knew people there. This was my communities, families, friends. So I know personally people that were affected by this uh, in many, many ways. So this was really, really hard for me on the personal level, but I felt like I have to do something. So for me, being part of the Tzedek Centers made me, made me frame how I can take all these hard and difficult emotions and at the end of the day do something that could help communities. 
So it happened on 11 in the morning on the 7th of October. The TEDx centers opened a form And that form connected between families of evacu of families that wanted to host and evacuees. And through minutes, we had hundreds of people filling this form. This was really a basic form online that we, we put it online on our Facebook and our Instagram and our WhatsApp groups. And people just filled that form and it exploded online. It was super, super viral. And a lot of families that wanted to host, like I'm talking about thousands of families, thousands of um, open apartments that people had, and just really, really generous people all around the country. And on the other hand, we had evacuees from different cities. Um, I would like to say that because of the policy of the seven kilometers, so some people don't get any benefits or grants that they could evacuate and get money for that. So at the end of the day, if they decide to evacuate and they live in an area in a city which is more than seven kilometers, they don't get any money. So they have to do it on their own with their abilities and their um, economical situation. So Lisa Ford to it, Uh, about the differences between people that are staying in the same area. So just, just so you know about the evacuees, that we have people coming from Sderot, um, Netivot, Ofakim, Ashkelon, a lot of these areas. We did have some people that came from Sderot and the Kibbutzim, but mostly from the three cities of Ofakim, Ashkelon, and Netivot. And after we had that form, like our, our emergency response just grew from day to day. And we had hundreds of volunteers and staff members that became staff members day to day. So all our, our emergency response just grew. So as I said at the beginning, we started with connecting between families of evacuees and families they'd wanted to host. And it was important for us to find Uh, a specific family they would like to host according to the specific needs of every family. So this is not easy uh, to find a home that would be exactly, if it's a kosher, if it was, say, to have a big house, or if you need something that would be comfortable with children. So these are a lot of things that we had to come in conclusion when we did all these matches. So we had volunteers doing these matches between the, the um, families. Um, and then later on, we understood after doing these matches that the, family, the families have of evacuees had more needs. They needed help and legal advice. They, de they needed emotional help. They needed um, like um, food. They needed um, furniture. They needed all kinds of things. They had different needs. So we established a project that was called Help on the Way which did all kinds of things. But first of all, we had, we had this booklet which organized all the information about what is going on, about um, if you need uh, food, if you need to take food, where you can get it. If you need mental health, how do you get it? So we had a physical booklet of more than 50 pages that organized all this information, which this booklet We, we passed on all this, knowledges, all this knowledge uh, to people in the army in Ashkelon and people in municipalities. So this knowledge was um, turned over to more people. And we had volunteers calling all the families that we had an open home that evacuated or called us. And we had volunteers calling each and every one of these families and trying to see how to help. We had lawyers that helped people with bureaucracy during this time if uh, their house happened damaged or something happened to where they work um, that helped them with all this legal advice. We had a social worker that had a social network of hundreds of social workers that help these families um, and more and more things and this was amazing. And then later on, we understood that a lot of communities, the Russian-speaking communities, uh, didn't evacuate. So like I said, there is a difference between cities that are in the seven kilometers and there's a difference between cities that 
um, are not in the seven kilometers. So we discovered that even in Sderot, which is a city that is under attack all the time, there were 4,000 elderly Russian-speaking people that stayed back, that stayed there and didn't want to leave. And we had volunteers that went there and helped them with food and medicine and did all kinds of activities for them and worked together with the municipality. And what happened is that um, a lot of things of the government uh, weren't uh, translated. So we had a lot of volunteers that went over to houses of elderly people in the cities, like I said, Sderot, Netivot, Fakim, and Ashkelon, and translated things to them and talked to them. Um, so that was another branch of something that we did. And then um, what happened is three weeks during uh, the war, I get a call one day from the mayor of Netivot, which is called Yechiel Zohar, which I know closely because I used to work in the municipality there in different positions. And we kept in touch after, after I finished uh, to work there. And he asked me to come back to the municipality and help him. What I used to do is um, during corona, I help establish a department for businesses and try to help them recover from what happened and help them fill, fill grants and give them all kinds of courses. So he asked me to come back uh, to the municipality and I told him that I'm in the middle of uh, organizing a national project of emergency response of the TEDx centers but, and that, that I would love to, to come and see how we can cooperate. And he, was happy to, and he was happy to hear about that and he said he would like to meet. So what happened that we, we went to the south um, people that are a crew from the emergency response and we talked to him and we, we talked to him about the TEDx centers and what we did in the emergency time and what is the, the, the TEDx centers in general and what do we do like I said before about organizing and, uh, and developing community and after talking with him and after talking with other people that are in high position in the municipalities in the cities of Fakim, Ashkelon, and Nitivot, um, we built a special model, which this model is, um, is taking the tools and the TEDx centers and trying to see how we could build the resilience with the community, how we can build um, the communities with each other together after what happened, how we could um, uh, build the resilience of the people and making them feel safe in the city that, are, that they are living in. So in this model, we, we decided to focus on Ofakim, Ashkelon, and Tivot, which are cities that together include 300,000 people. This is a big amount of people. And these cities, um, are, is cities are cities where people are neglected. Uh, people don't have enough bomb shelters. Uh, just so you know that 51 of the percent of the people that are living there in Ashkelon don't have a shelter. This is more than half of the, the percentage of the people. Um, Netivot is just eight kilometers from the Gaza Strip and they don't get any benefits, any grants, anything from the government during all this time. So this is, and people are affected by this. This is years of years of neglect, of neglection. I'm sorry, I'm really excited. So uh, I, know, I don't know if you could see it, but I'm really, really honored to be here. So this is why it takes me a minute sometimes. Um, and these, in each and every one of these cities, they are living uh, different communities which are discriminated for years. Um, they live in the periphery of Israel, um, which means they are, f they are far from all kinds of jobs. They don't get the same social services like other places in Israel. Like I said, they didn't get any benefits of the country. So this is a really fragile situation. And these are cities which have had all kinds of um, rounds, if you can call them, or, or different wars in the past, like Tsukaitan. And this is people that are living with high anxiety and high fear for, for security. Um, and even this morning we had in Etivot, we have 50, 50 rockets that just this morning, this is like an enormous amount of rockets in the morning. One day, even not a day, just a few hours. So this is like really absurd. So, and that's why we decided to take these three cities and focus on them. And we wanted to take a project manager 
that would be a part of the Tzedek Center um, and take the tools that we have to the community and with the community and with the municipality. And then every single city will establish these tools. So every project manager is working with the municipality. It means that he is part of the municipality and is part of a certain department of the municipality. So with every municipality, we talked and we discovered what is the specific needs that they need. Because I don't know if you know, but in Ufakim, there was a murder of 50 people. And we're talking about two blocks of of two blocks that are close to each other, 50 people were killed there. It means that like every house has someone that was killed or injured, and, this is, and these people don't get anything from the government, so this is absurd. Um, and like I said before, um, so in, uh, in every city, we really thought how specifically to help the community with the municipality. So um, every project manager is doing something different, a little, but is doing something about building the resilience with the community. So I will say, and I'll, I'll go into every city, I would say what every city is doing now, every project manager is doing, so you know a little bit about the same things and the different things. And, and then I'll, I'll continue saying uh, more things about how the aesthetic centers are establishing for the long term. So um, in Ashkelon, we did all kinds of uh, talks with the people in the municipality, with the community there. We had, like Lisa said, we referred before, we had um, activities that happened in uh, shelters. So we had the Shomer Tzair in Ashkelon. So together with them, in Ashkelon specifically, we, are, we, are doing, we decided to take a neighborhood and work with the Shomer Tzair in a certain neighborhood. And in Ofakim, because what happened, we understood that the community needed help with the bureaucracy, uh, with the government, about filling forms. So we have a project manager that is focusing on that, about how to get uh, to every, every person in the city and every person to fill all the forms that he needs, according to get the benefits that he's um, entitled to. And in Etivot, we're doing something that is a little bit wider about uh, building the resilience with the communities, with different kinds of uh, leaders from every neighborhood. And in every city, we are taking the, the tools, like I said, of leadership and organizing and establishing it. And what will happen is that every project manager will be a part of the municipality during the war. And when the war will end, we're going to open a Tzedek Center like we have tzedek centers all around Israel. And that will be a tzedek center that will do uh, community organizing and leadership. And what that project manager will have a base of what he did before is being a part of the municipality. And he will take that base and continue that to establish the tzedek center. Um, and me, myself, I'm really, really honored to lead this this project because I know these people. These are my friends, like I said before. This is my colleagues. These are, this is my family. These are people that I feel obligated. I talk with them all the time, and I feel super, super connected to them. So I'm really, really honored to lead this project on my personal level. Uh, and, and I'm really, really happy to be here. And I would like to say something uh, really personal at the end about my connection uh, to the States, um, just to like, you, just so you'll know my background. So my mom is from Rhode Island, and I have roots in Providence. And my great grandmother was a part of establishing the Miriam Hospital. Uh, and my mom made Aliyah to Israel when she was 26. So for me, I'm standing here in all these uh, kinds of positions, and I'm really, really excited to be here and being a part of my family and being a part of doing this mission in Israel and talking to you guys about it. And I would like to open up if someone has any questions I would like to answer. So I think that is a good question. Uh, do you want me to repeat that? OK. So people are asking in the chat, how can they help from here to Israel? 
So I think there is many, many ways to do it. But I think first of all is to see um, about what projects are trying to do things for the long term. What kind of things are trying to build the community. Because now in Israel we are in a situation where we are still in war. The war is still happening. Uh, I hope it ends soon. I would love it to end soon. Um, but on the other hand, it's still going on. And it's really, really complicated on the same, on the same hand, the same time. So I think that everything can help. Solidarity can help. If you want to follow us on the Tzedek Centers and want to be a part, you can do that. If Yes, yes. We have a website that's called Tzedek Centers. Um, and we have here forms for the people that want to leave their details. And if in the chat people want to follow, um, they could just write their email, and we would add them to our newsletters. We have newsletters. There is a website. Um, it's called Merkazim Letzedek. Uh, we'll write it afterwards at the end, exactly every letter and letter, because I don't want to lead you, mislead you to, uh, uh, um, I wanted to lead you to the right uh, website. Um, okay, so that is that is what I think, but there are many, many ways to help. I think everyone needs to find what is what their calling is. Um, but I really think the long term of building resilience is the really important one. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, I will, I'll repeat the question. What is your name? Avi. Avi, okay. So Avi asked, um, he said that he saw that at the beginning the country didn't really step up, so and he wondered if and there were a lot of organizations that are trying to build the communities and help, and what's the situation now, right, Avi? That is, okay. So I think um, now the situation is a little different uh, in a way which I think that the government and I think municipalities understand that they are they are the base of the communities. And I think that it's it's different. I will answer this on different levels. I think the government is one thing, and I think the municipalities is a different things. The government, I think, is now ch trying to understand and try to understand during the war. But I think that there is a lot of different interests that are involved, a lot of politics. So on one hand, I see that there is a lot of um, good things that are happening by the government. And the other hand, I see really complicated things or things that I would have what to say about and not in a good way about the government. And on the other hand, I want to say, say a good thing about the municipalities because the municipalities were a really, really important base in every city in Israel of, of being um, a certain um, authority that is there and there to stay and there to help and see how she how every municipality can do better. And they were municipalities that str struggled through this because it wasn't easy. I think the war kind of kind of found um, everyone in a different position and really, really hard emotional, physical position. Um, but I think that that um, Government things, some of them are good, some of them are less, and the municipalities are our future and our stable base to, to, be, to be holding all the situation. So I hope I answered your question. Is there more questions? First, I want to thank you, Maya, very well done. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, um, I'm gonna let you <laughs> say that question so everyone will hear and I will answer it. Yeah, it was a long question. Okay, so from what I understand, you're asking about the organizations that were, weren't doing things about 
helping society in that kind of way and that shifted to do that and how do I see that as according to today, as according to the needs of the people and according to the organizations? Are you concerned that there will be a gap as mm. move away from? Okay, and am I concerned if there's a gap from these organizations moving away from the situation? So, um, I'll tell you the truth. Um, on one hand, I am concerned because what happened is even during the war, we understood that organizations that we worked with at the beginning and part of the emergency response were super, um, they wanted to help, they wanted to do, they were super, super on it, and it was really important for them, and that was their mission. And after a amount of time, you know, people go back to work, people have, um, Uh, in different issues in their life, people go to service, things happen, people go back to study, and the volunteer, um, volunteer issue has become shrunk through the time on one hand. On the other hand, you see all the time people wanting to volunteer and do things in organization as well. So <clears throat> I think on one hand, All the situation showed all of us that people that organize can do good and could be a really part, an important part of our building communities and resilience. And on the other hand, we see that uh, we need a structure. We need a country. We need municipalities. We need that in order to have a healthy society that will take care of each and every one of, of us. So on one hand, I am concerned um, because I saw it affect even during the emergency response. Um, we have soup homes that closed because they couldn't do it anymore, or other organization that shifted and did other things, so I am concerned. But on the other hand, I'm really hope, I'm hopeful um, because I feel that people know that we have the power to connect, we have the power to help each other, and we have the power to do things together. And that is a big, knowledgeable fact that I think that every Israeli now has in his mind and his heart. So I hope I answered your question correctly. Before we end, we want to say one more thing to the panel. Okay, the yes. Out in um, uh, live stream land, which we're saying our groups are not coming back together. They're ending on their own. Thank you to all of you who are on the live stream all over the country who've stayed. And... Um, Suzanne, thank you for taking all their names and questions and emails. We wanted to also tell you about the relationship that this synagogue now has with one specific kibbutz, which is a Hashemaritz at your kibbutz. We have a fund here, an Israel fund, uh, Israel Impact Fund, that our community started and decided to have a relationship just with one community to make it better for one community. So um, we are working with the Kibbutz Cholit, which you are also working with. They are a Hashem at your Kibbutz. And just like Lisa talked about um, doing things to make them feel more regular, um, recently we got to see pictures of the kitchen that they were able to build at the hotel that they are at, at in En Gedi so that they could have communal meals. We heard about that there, and this is from this community, they're about to also have open a, like a room for like a moadzon, a pub and a yoga space so that again they can get together and do communal work, communal, community kibbutz time together. And um, also as you heard, many people, everyone walked out with no clothes. Um, so the Israel Impact Fund was able to help everyone from the kibbutz to buy winter clothes. And as they move forward, we know all of their therapy is coming through the Tzedek Center. So we're so happy our synagogue and our community to be in partnership with the Tzedek Centers. Thank you so much for all you are doing and for spending your less than a week in America, part of it in frigid Princeton. Thank you so much. I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, do we have any questions that we should uh, wrap it up? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys.